Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your Thanksgiving and were able to take some time to reflect on all we have to be thankful for as Vermonters and Americans. Today, we'll talk boosters. Mr. Pichek will go over some data. Secretary French will give an education update. And we'll, of course, have a health update from Dr. Levine. As we've been saying, if you gathered with friends and family outside your household at Thanksgiving, we recommend you get tested because it's been a critical tool in helping to prevent the spread of COVID. And Vermont does more testing than any other state. Finding cases helps contain them before they spread to more people, and it will continue to be an essential tool for years to come as we move towards the endemic phase of managing COVID. As we've said, like last year, it's expected we'll see an increase of cases across the country and in Vermont after the holiday. Once again, this is all the more reason to take common sense precautions. First and foremost, get vaccinated and boosted. It's not too late. Wear a mask indoors when in public spaces. Be smart when getting together with others and stay home if you're sick. If you have minor symptoms or something feels off, err on the side of caution. Get tested and stay home. As you may have seen over the weekend, there's been more news of another variant, Omicron, which has started circulating around the world. As President Biden said yesterday, this may be cause for some concern, but not panic. Dr. Levine will go into more detail, but it's important to remember, there's still a lot we don't know, and it could be a couple of weeks before we get more information. Until then, we're not going to speculate. And I'd urge people to stay focused on the facts and what we do know. We'll be watching this close, closely, but we, we, what we do know is that getting your booster will be key and everyone over 18 is eligible. They're already having a huge impact, not only reducing severe illness, but also in slowing cases amongst those who have gotten them. They're the best way to make sure you get maximum protection against this variant and any others that will be inevitably occur occurring in the future. If you get your booster in the next week, you'll have the optimum protection, amount of protection, before Christmas and the New Year. Vermont now leads the nation in boosters, but we need to do better. Same goes for vaccinations of five to 11 year olds. We're a national leader, but we have more work to do. If you get your child vaccinated this week, they'll be able to have their second dose by Christmas and the New Year, making sure they're fully vaccinated by the time they return to school after winter break. Doing so will lead to fewer quarantines and more time in school. You can find a clinic near you at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek. Uh, thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, as we expected, um, you know, both in Vermont, uh, in New England, and across the country, there were reporting delays and anomalies associated with the Thanksgiving holiday. So, when you look at cases, uh, cases nationally, regionally in Vermont are down. Uh, but as we'll explain a little bit here, for Vermont's cases, and the same is true for the other regions of the country. Uh, testing was down and reporting uh, was uh, changed for uh, many of those states that uh, usually report uh, over the weekend uh, or don't even report over the weekend delayed till Monday. So some anomalies in the data, you see our cases are down, as I said, but as you go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, testing is also down, down about 32% on the seven day average. Again, to be expected as um, fewer people seek testing on Thanksgiving Day, for example, and even the weekend of Thanksgiving as they're traveling or have friends or family uh, that are visiting them. 
Uh, so that did move our positivity rate up, but as I just said, you know, those that are likely to seek testing on Thanksgiving and over the Thanksgiving holiday, probably more likely to be uh, symptomatic uh, and have COVID or at least think that they have COVID through an exposure or symptoms similar to COVID symptoms. So uh, somewhat to be expected, uh, can't draw too much into it uh, at this point. Um, but what we can look at is sort of how this patterns versus Thanksgiving of last year. And we do see very similar pattern uh, with cases uh, rising a little bit before the holiday and then plateauing, coming down uh, and staying low uh, through the days following the Thanksgiving holiday. Again, due to reporting and testing anomalies, people not getting tested, uh, and in some cases reporting uh, being delayed. So a very similar pattern to what we saw last year. Uh, that would indicate to us that we'll see cases start to rise again this week. And then the question will be, you know, do they get back to where they were, or, or do we see a surge on top of that? And that is something we just don't know at this time. The only real reliable um, jurisdiction that we can point to at the moment in terms of case trends is to Quebec. Uh, looking at Quebec, they did not celebrate, obviously, American Thanksgiving. When we look at their case rates, we see that they have been increasing, uh, like much of New England, uh, through the last number of months, more particularly in November as the weather has gotten colder. Uh, so again, we do anticipate cases going back uh, to where they were prior to the Thanksgiving holiday uh, once normal testing uh, resumes in terms of people going and getting testing on a more routine basis. Turning to hospitalizations, this is where uh, we can find some data that was not interrupted by the Thanksgiving holiday, both here in Vermont and regionally. You see that hospitalizations across the board are up about 12% over the last seven days. You'll see that still that 71% of those are of individuals not fully vaccinated, so that story hasn't changed. Uh, you'll see that over the last couple of days, we did have hospitalizations in the 80s, so those are higher than obviously we've seen before, and that is trending up. Uh, so as the governor said, all the more important to take those preventative measures now for those that aren't boosted, critical that you do so, and for those who aren't vaccinated, critical to start as well. Uh, same on the ICU side, you can see the ICU numbers have gone up this week. Uh, they are at 31% uh, in terms of an increase for the week. Again, 81% of people in the ICU are not fully vaccinated. So. We do know that those who are not fully vaccinated are going to the hospital at a much higher rate, and they're spending longer in the hospital on average as well, consuming more hospital resources. So critical for those um, that are not protected uh, to get themselves protected to ensure capacity uh, in our hospitals. Looking at the ICU metrics, we can see that capacity was down this week, about 32%. It seems like some of that is related, obviously, to the increase that we saw in COVID patients. There was somewhat of a decrease in non-COVID patients, uh, but there was also seemed to be some work short, shortage challenges, or at least some beds that were offline, alluding, you know, meaning that the, uh, the availability number uh, went down this week. So again, something to keep a close eye on uh, as we monitor cases following Thanksgiving. And again, Vermont is not alone here. We look at the numbers across New England, and you can see that uh, hospitalizations are up. They're up about 15% over the last week and up about 38% over the last two weeks. So uh, numbers are trending up across the board here in the region. And just like Vermont, the case numbers were interrupted for New England. Those are not particularly reliable for this week, but the hospitalization numbers uh, were reported through the holiday and through the weekend and gives us a little bit of a better snapshot of where we stand at the moment. So looking at booster shots, we see that Vermont uh, continues to have strong uptake of the booster. We are number one when it comes to the full population across the board, uh, the 18 and older population, the 50 and older, and most importantly at this point, the 65 and older population, just under 64% of those who are 65 and older who are fully vaccinated have also gotten their booster. On the next slide, you'll see that uh, the rate of that uptake has remained relatively steady and continues to do so uh, even before the Thanksgiving holiday and afterward. And what does that, what does that mean and what does it continue to mean for Vermonters uh, here? Just look at the next slide, you'll see the dramatic difference between those who are not fully vaccinated, those who are fully vaccinated but don't have a booster, and those who are fully vaccinated with a booster, and looking at the rates in which those populations are going to the hospital for the month of November, you can see that those who are fully vaccinated but not boosted, they have quite a bit of protection relative to those who are not uh, vaccinated at all. But when you look at those who are fully vaccinated with a booster, they are much less likely to end up in the hospital compared to that not fully vaccinated population. That not fully vaccinated population is 13.5 times more likely 
for the month of November to require hospital care compared to those who are fully vaccinated and have a booster shot. And we're seeing the impact uh, on this in terms of um, fatalities as well. So we're doing a good job in Vermont of protecting our most vulnerable and our most vulnerable are doing a good job of protecting themselves by getting boosted. And you can see just looking at the last three months that our cases have continued to go up. November in particular, just about 10,000 cases for this month. But you can see at the same time that the fatality numbers here in Vermont have been trending down uh, with uh, 34 deaths so far in the month of November. Possible that there'll be additional deaths recorded in the month of November, but it's clear that the fatalities are staying steady, even going down while cases continue to go up uh, and pretty significantly up in the month of November. So this turns to our forecast where, uh, again, we do not anticipate cases to go down over the next four weeks. Uh, we uh, do anticipate that they will get back to where they were prior to Thanksgiving. And then the question, of course, is what is the impact of Thanksgiving on the cases and then, of course, on hospitalizations and so on. So we'll keep a close eye on that. We noticed that with Halloween, that impact was felt more quickly than it was last year. So we'll keep a close eye on the case numbers uh, for the end of this week uh, and into the weekend and early next week. Just really quickly looking at campuses, you know, testing was down. There was a half a week last week for most college campuses. Just a very few number of tests uh, reported positive with 17 cases across campus. Looking at the long-term care facilities, you can see that the um, number of outbreaks stands at 17 with 219 cases associated with an outbreak. Uh, this is up from last week, but like we said last week, appears to be uh, primarily in the staff rather than the residents. The resident numbers have stayed pretty steady uh, in terms of um, their case growth, which is certainly a good sign. And then closing out, looking at the vaccine numbers. Uh, so vaccination, we continue to do quite well uh, near the top or at the top with all of these important metrics that we've been following. And then the most recent metric, the five to 11 year old population based on CDC data, you can see Vermont is the national leader really head and shoulders above any other state at this point. So really want to thank parents and caregivers for uh, going out and getting uh, their five to 11 year olds uh, vaccinated and protected. We want to obviously improve on that, but uh, really, really a good start and really critical because that age group continues to have about double the case rate of all the other age groups when you look at um, the most recent data. So really critical to get that age group vaccinated in particular. And with that, I'll now turn it over to uh, Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good, good afternoon. Our schools are back in session this week after a well-deserved uh, Thanksgiving break. Uh, it's also nice to see the first snow of the year. It uh, makes recess a lot of fun. Um, Secretary Smith will provide an update on the vaccination efforts, including uh, 5 through 11 vaccination, but I want to take a moment to thank uh, everyone that's involved in that effort. Prior to Thanksgiving, uh, I visited a 5 through, 11, 5 through 11 vaccination clinic at the Champlain Elementary School in the Burlington School District. Uh, with the U.S. Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona. Um, the work of the health department staff, the health district employees, EMS staff, school employees, and the many volunteers that were involved made a real strong impression on both of us. Um, Secretary Cardona remarked and walked away with a, a real vivid understanding of what makes Vermont schools and our community so special. I particularly want to thank the parents and the students uh, who accepted uh, our presence and the presence of our media and our staff that toured the clinics with us. Um, we certainly appreciated the patients in a gracious way the families allowed us to participate in that uh, important moment. Coming back uh, from Thanksgiving, our schools continue to expand their response testing, including test to stay. Uh, I wanted to provide some updated numbers on test to stay. Currently, we have 43 school districts, or over 70% of our school districts uh, enrolled in test to stay, and that number has been increasing steadily each week. Um, when I say enrolled, these districts uh, are either implementing test to stay or awaiting the arrival of their test kits, which have been ordered and should be delivered this week. Uh, we also have 24 independent schools enrolled in test to stay. As of the 23rd last week, uh, we had 112 schools conducting antigen tests under test to stay. That was approximately 9,000 tests, uh, which equates to saving over 9,000 in-person instructional days. Parental consents required to participate in any of our response testing programs, including test to stay. Uh, as of yesterday, we had 17,000 parental consent forms submitted in the system. 
I am consistently hearing that test to stay is going very well and districts are pleased with the amount of instruction uh, that they're saving. Uh, for example, yesterday I heard from the Caledonia Central Supervisory Union in the Danville area. Uh, they had some cases in their schools coming off the Thanksgiving break. Uh, they worked hard over the weekend to implement test to stay uh, Monday, the first day back from the vacation. Uh, among Cabot, Danville, and Waterford schools, they had 46 students participate in test to stay yesterday. Waterford had 29 of the 46 students, and they were able to test all of them uh, with the antigen tests in 50, 50 minutes, five zero minutes. All the students tested negative, uh, which meant they were able to be in school yesterday as opposed to being quarantined. Um, I understand these students also tested negative again this morning. We'll continue to work with districts to expand test to stay. Uh, one of the supports we put together at the state level is access to a temporary staffing contract. We're using federal funds to lever leverage a state contract with a company called ATA Services, uh, which handles temp uh, contracts uh, to hire uh, par part time on site staff to help districts with implementing test to stay and other aspects of the testing and vaccination program. We developed a job description for the temp positions in cooperation with the State School Nurses Association. Uh, these temp staff will be available to assist, assist with a variety of activities related to COVID-19 testing, including our vaccination program as well. Um, ATA partnered with us to identify how many initial hires each district would need uh, based on a variety of factors, including total enrollment, uh, geography, a number of schools, and regional positivity rates. ATA spent the week of the 22nd recruiting for these positions and they report they have 60 candidates available. Uh, they pre-screen resumes and then send the qualified candidates to the districts for interviewing. Uh, as of yesterday, 21 uh, staff have been sent to 16 separate districts for that interview process. We're also working on plans to expand test to stay to pre-K programs. Uh, this work includes securing additional testing supplies as well as working through the logistical considerations that are unique uh, to this younger student population. We'll have more news on that soon. We are encouraging school districts to conduct more testing after the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, we sent out over 2,500 PCR take-home test kits uh, and more are on the way this week to support the additional needs for testing. Uh, lastly, I wanted to provide an update on our student vaccination incentive program we talked about earlier this fall. Uh, we do expect to launch this program later this week. Under this program, schools can qualify for a grant award when they achieve a high vaccination rate among their student body. Uh, we designed this program, which is funded through federal COVID dollars, uh, to not only encourage student vaccination, but also to involve students more directly in the use of these grant funds at the school level. We wanted to wait to launch this program until 5 through 11 vaccination was fully up and running so the elementary schools could participate as well. Um, again, we'll have more information on this program later in the week. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll start with an update on vaccines for children age 5 to 11 and booster shots. And then I'll provide an update on hospital capacity and COVID testing over the Thanksgiving holiday. As of today, 19,358 children ages five to 11 have received their first dose of COVID vaccine, or they have made an appointment to get their shot. That's just over 44% of all Vermont children ages five to 11 years old. As we prepare for the winter holiday season, you still have time to get your child vaccinated before you gather with family and friends to celebrate. You can make an appointment for your child at healthvermont.gov slash kids vaccine. That's healthvermont.gov slash kids vaccine or by contacting your local pharmacy or doctor's office. You can also call 855-722-7878 that's the call center for making an appointment for a vaccine. If you are a parent or guardian and you have questions about vaccines, the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics are hosting uh, several online forums through December 20th. It's a great time to have a doctor answer your questions. All events are held from 7 to 8 p.m. via Zoom, and there is one scheduled for this evening please visit the website at aapvt.org 
for the complete schedule. In terms of booster doses, approximately 158,000 people have received a booster dose, and we continue, as uh, Commissioner Pichek had mentioned, to lead the nation in this category. We are already seeing the impact of lower case counts among the, those 65 and older as boosters increase in that age group. Now, everyone 18 and older is eligible. Again, if you have time to protect yourself, make the time to protect yourself, family, and friends by getting a booster before the holidays. Please get your booster. Moving on to hospital capacity, the teams are working to bring additional subacute and ICU beds online. So far, as I mentioned last week, an additional 47 subacute beds have been identified, and 13 of those beds are expected to be available this week. We do have vacancies in beds that we've already put online. Uh, we have 26 beds that are available um, as of this morning. That's out of the 80 beds that we helped bring online recently. In terms of ICU beds, one additional bed is available at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. The University of Vermont uh, Medical Center will also add five additional ICU beds. And we will continue to work with Central Vermont Medical Center and Northwestern Medical Center to bring additional beds online. We will continue to evaluate the need and the ability to bring more beds online as needed. Now, I want to let you know how things went with the two new testing technologies that I, miss, I mentioned last week, the self-administered PCR test and the LAMP rapid results test. The self-administered test went smoothly, and you can expect to see more appointments for that type of test to become available over the next few weeks. Offering the self-administered test allows us to scale up quickly, adding more appointments and taking walk-ins in critical areas around the state. Now for the LAMP test. As you know, we deployed this technology on Wednesday for two reasons. The national labs were shut down for a few days over the holidays, and labs weren't available. And number two, as part of our future strategy on testing and contact tracing, we expect to be transitioning to a more rapid testing and self-administered or take-home option for tests. Overall, things went well, and we were able to offer testing appointments throughout the state. A total of 1,130 tests were processed on Wednesday. We heard from many Vermonters that were very pleased to have the results in time for their holiday travel plans. We have spoken with the majority of people that were tested on Wednesday, and we have learned a lot from the collective experiences, and that's what we were trying to do with this uh, rollout to see what people thought of, uh, of the technology. And like I said, overall people thought it went very well, but there were a few challenges. Um, nearly 100 people waited until Friday to get their results. Uh, software issues caused complications when trying to register minors, although eventually that was a, there was a workaround to fix that issue. In addition, at two locations, a few people were told that they needed a cell phone to use the new testing tools. This was inaccurate. We are working to have vendor, the vendor provide better training on the new site technology um, to those working uh, at these sites. In at least three sites, uh, learning the new technology caused wait times up to an hour for a brief period of time during the day. All in all, like I said, it was a, su a success, and as soon as the supply chain improves for rapid tests, Vermonters can expect us to more fully develop and deploy this technology. In the meantime, Vermont still leads the nation in the availability in testing per capita. I also want to mention that there was an issue with some test results processed at UVM Medical Center last Wednesday due to a lab error. A total of 25 tests were affected. 
16 negative results should have been positive, eight positive results should have been negative, and one positive result should have been inconclusive. All individuals have been contacted and UVMMC is putting processes in place to, pr to prevent the error from ever happening in the future. Lastly, I want to repeat some points I made about contact tracing and testing a couple of weeks ago because we are in a transition on how we're going to do both. I have already mentioned the transition to a more rapid testing platform, so let me concentrate on contact tracing. During the pandemic, we have learned a lot, and we constantly are adopting our approaches as we encounter different circumstances. This evolution includes educating the public on how to respond to a positive test. We began doing this on the health department's website several months ago, and now we're asking people to reach out immediately to their contacts following a positive test result instead of waiting for the Department of Health to contact them. This will significantly speed up the notification of contacts. If Vermonters need guidance, the Department of Health website provides detailed instructions to learn more, go to healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 positive for more information about what to do if you test positive for COVID-19. I, I wanna emphasize this, contact tracing will continue. According to the CDC, only a few states engage in contact tracing to the same extent as Vermont, and Vermont is considered a leader in this effort. We still have the equivalent of 156 full-time people who are dedicated to contact tracing, but their efforts, will pri their efforts will be prioritized with outbreaks and vulnerable populations. Please remember, if you have a positive test result, contact your healthcare provider to get advice on how to care for yourself and to see if monoclonal antibodies are a treatment option for you isolate immediately, and then reach out to your close contacts. If you have any questions, we are just, we're always just a phone call away at 855-722-7878. As always, thank you for doing your part. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you. I hope you all had a very nice Thanksgiving and kept your gatherings safe. As you know, COVID transmission is still high right now, which means you could have the virus and not know it. So please remember, you can still lower the risk of any potential spread of COVID-19 by getting tested five to seven days after your gathering, which means any time in the next several days. Testing is the only way to know if you have the virus and is key to protecting one another, especially those who are at higher risk of serious illness. We've been talking more about the use of at-home tests, which are typically rapid antigen tests. I want to remind you that if you use this and do test positive, you should treat it as any other positive test. That means, and this is on cue from Secretary Smith's comments a moment ago, isolate yourself at home and away from others and reach out to your close contacts. How do you know who's a close contact? It's pretty easy. First, you determine your infectious period. This will be 48 hours before your symptoms began or if you don't have any symptoms, 48 hours before the day you got tested. Then, recall where you were, who you were with during that time period. If any of those people were within six feet of you for a total of 15 minutes or more over a 24-hour period, they are your close contacts. Then reach out to let them know you've tested positive for COVID. We also ask that you report your result to the health department at health vermont.gov slash COVID-19 positive, where you will find a link to the Vermont COVID-19 self-test result reporting form. 
This helps us understand how many Vermonters are being tested and how the virus is spreading in our communities. And don't forget, if you are at higher risk, please talk to your health care provider about monoclonal antibody treatment as soon as you test positive. Higher risk means 65 or older or certain medical conditions. Remember, the treatment works best in the first five days <clears throat> when you're most likely to have mild to moderate symptoms and at that time can reduce your chance of being hospitalized by 70%. This is especially important now with our case levels remaining where they are and our hospitalization num numbers remaining where they are. I also want to specifically refer to some of Commissioner Pichek's data regarding the hospitals because slightly less than half of the hospital stays right now in Vermont are in southwestern Vermont in uh, Rutland and Bennington areas. So anyone testing positive in those areas with mild or moderate symptoms should question uh, with their health care provider if they are eligible for monoclonal antibodies and potentially avoid a hospitalization. And I'm really happy to report that we're seeing all of our hospitals uh, ordering more doses of monoclonal antibodies and deploying more of those doses as well. We've doubled the number of doses ordered in the last several weeks. And in terms of doses used, if you go back to the beginning of September, we used a total of 17 doses across the state. In the last week, this has increased to almost 225 doses. We're actively working through the healthcare system, through FEMA and our EMS partners to supplement hospital capacity, to continue administering doses at long-term care facilities, and hopefully in the very near future, organizing mobile units as well. These are all essential components of our strategy because even as we learn more about the oral medications in the pipeline, the monoclonal antibodies remain our most effective treatment currently for COVID-19 for people at higher risk. Now obviously the biggest news of the past week has been the identification of the new variant named Omicron. We've already seen several mutations and variants of the virus that causes COVID-19. This is expected of viruses, as we've said in the past. It's why we have new flu vaccines each year to deal with the predominant strains. Many variants emerge, many variants disappear. Some can persist, and some can become the most common variant, like Delta has done. Now, Omicron does have some features that are concerning, namely that it appears to be more infectious, though that's still being determined, and it's already shown up, as we all know, in several countries around the world, including on our continent, Canada. However, there's still plenty that is unknown, including whether Omicron will affect the severity of illness and how effective the current vaccines are against it. There have been no identified cases associated with the Omicron variant in Vermont to date. We continue to obtain genomic sequencing information on SARS-CoV-2 specimens, and obviously will report any detection of this variant in Vermont. <clears throat> now, while scientists are learning more about this new variant, and this will take several weeks, we can ramp up our own defenses against the virus that is already spreading at high levels, and we can do it right now. This means, of course, getting vaccinated, including younger kids age five and older. I'm really heartened by the data that says we're leading the nation in that age group, and we are getting more and more effective uh, at getting first doses into all of those children at any site that they so choose, whether it's at a school-based clinic, a community clinic, pharmacy, pediatrician office, what have you. I ask those parents who may still be waiting or sitting on the fence and not ready to plunge ahead with the vaccine to go to one of those forums that you heard discussed 
They're on the AAP Vermont website. Have your concerns and questions answered and try to more rapidly make that decision because still on a day-to-day -day basis, we're seeing 20% of all of the cases of COVID in Vermont occurring in this age group. It also means get your booster shot for those uh, in the age 18 and older category. To get your booster, you only have to be 18 or older. And two months since your J&J &J or six months since your messenger RNA vaccine, Pfizer or Moderna. And you can get any type of vaccine for your booster. As you've seen, we're doing incredibly well with boosters, but we must do better. With Delta still active, and with the threat of a potential new variant, getting a booster should be front of mind right now. Being fully vaccinated and having your booster should, in fact, be your primary strategy for avoiding a serious outcome. This is important for anyone of any age, especially if you're over 65. And you may have noticed yesterday, the CDC has begun to change its messaging not to confuse the population further with, are you in the should group or the may group for getting a booster? Everyone should get a booster who qualifies by their age and the number of months since their last vaccine. If you need more reasons to get a booster, it's free, it's easy. It boosts your own antibody levels to give you more protection, especially against severe illness and hospitalization. Even if you should become infected, having had a booster will probably limit the severity of your symptoms. And by protecting yourself, you protect those around you, including family, community, and those who are more vulnerable. And the more Vermonters that are protected, the less burden on our healthcare system, which means people who need hospital care for whatever reason can get it. Timing is everything, and it being fresh in your mind is everything. If you get that booster today, it will be fully effective in two weeks, more than enough time in front of the holidays. Visit healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine to find a location near you. Finally, an FDA advisory committee is meeting today, as we speak, to discuss recommendations regarding a pill to treat COVID called Molnupiravir. Merck is the company that makes the drug. It has said that its data showed the pill reduced the risk of hospitalization and death among high-risk COVID patients by 30%. Now, I realize this is less than the original estimate of 50%, but it is still much greater than having no effect. This treatment still has great potential to make treatment easier and reduce the burden on our healthcare system, and we'll await the FDA review of all of the data uh, and see what we can say at the next press conference regarding that. Governor? Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. We'll start in the room. Governor, a few weeks ago, you had mentioned that once we hit 80 cases, or uh, 80 hospitalizations, that would put a, um, a significant strain on our hospital capacity uh, at, at the time. Today, as you've seen, we're at 84 hospitalized at 22 in the ICU. Has, has that changed your, your thinking at all about whether we should be taking further steps in, in addition to vaccines? Well, well, again, we are taking a lot of steps. Um, when you look at the number of uh, testing programs we have available today that we, uh, you know, we have increased uh, since then. Uh, the number of beds uh, available have increased as well. Uh, Secretary Smith and his team have been working to provide uh, more capacity, so that's helped. Uh, the mental health uh, uh, patients uh, that we can send to the VA clinic has helped. Everything that we've been doing has helped in that regard. We're still focused on the hospitalizations, uh, that still is a uh, key uh, for us, a, a metric for us to keep watching, but we have built out uh, capacity. When you look at the entire capacity of the healthcare system, we have about a, a thousand hospital beds available. Um, so out of that, 
you know, uh, on a typical, we have maybe uh, 6% today, maybe 8% of those are COVID beds. Um, we still have to watch uh, the other, uh, what's driving the other uh, cases as well. Um, so some uh, have, uh, have speculated that uh, because of all the conditions we placed on people over the last year and a half, uh, we prevented a lot of care from happening. Uh, and this pent up demand is what's driving that 90% um, that of capacity in the healthcare system. So we still have to pay attention to that. But again, here's the measures we're trying, I mean, I, we, we need to continue to push boosters they seem to be the most effective of everything. If you've been vaccinated, get your booster. If you haven't been vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you have been somewhere uh, when you um, uh, have been around others uh, or feel uh, ill in any way, um, get tested. Uh, it's free, it's easy, we do a lot of it, and that will help prevent the spread. Uh, again, uh, as instead of uh, many have focused on uh, whether it's a mask mandate or wearing masks, I'm asking people to wear your mask when indoors. That's especially when you're in public spaces. Having the continued um, debate about whether it should be mandated or whether it should be utilized is just uh, making the problem worse from my standpoint. It's dividing people even further. It's hardening people further. Um, from my standpoint, we know masks can be effective if you're wearing them. And forcing people to wear them has not proven uh, to be uh, effective uh, in, in many places across the, the, the country. So again, it's not as though we're not doing anything, we're doing a lot. And, uh, and I think that uh, um, opening up the hospital capacity uh, is something that, uh, that has been beneficial and we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to watch these numbers. Uh, we believe as well, again, this is speculation on our part, Everything you're seeing today is really two hospitals, and it's Bennington County and Rutland County. That's where we're seeing uh, the, the most increase. Uh, the rest of the hospitals are actually doing pretty well, and their numbers are very low. We don't know how many of the cases at this point, because of reporting, reporting data, how many of those cases are out of state, um, and from New York in particular. Uh, but we're trying to get that data uh, right now, and, um, and that makes a difference as well. So again, I just want to uh, make sure that we report on the right things, uh, the things that we can do to protect ourselves. Get, get vaccinated first and foremost, get vaccinated. And if you're vaccinated, get your booster and test, continue to test. Stay home when you're sick and wear your mask when you're indoors in public spaces. Anything you want to add, Secretary Smith? Okay. Going off of that, we are hearing from some folks at UVM Med that they are preparing for a surge capacity with this new variant, canceling some procedures. You know, like you said, the ICU bed capacity. Can Vermont handle another surge in cases even before this Omicron variant? Yeah. spreads, is that something that the system is even prepared to handle, depending upon how transmissible it is? Again, we believe so. Um, we, um, we appreciate uh, UVM Medical Center uh, taking this approach. We're trying to build out uh, capacity as well. And, and just pay attention to the numbers once again. We have about 100, I think about 100, 105 ICU beds. Um, so. Uh, at this point in time today, about 20% of those uh, are COVID related. The rest are uh, other illnesses and, uh, and accidents and so forth and disease. Um, and the, the number of, uh, of beds we have available uh, is about 1,000. So out of that, you know, about 8% 8, 8 or less are COVID related. So. Again, freeing up the capacity there, doing all we can individually will be helpful. Secretary Smith. Yeah, I think the governor really laid it out nicely in that we are seeing, we are seeing issues with, um, with hospitalizations that are coming from 
non-COVID, although there are, as the governor said, a, a small percentage of COVID cases that are driving this. The hospitals have been very good at working with us to increase capacity. For example, we have, um, we have as I mentioned, we have opened up 80 subacute beds um, with the help of the state working with long-term care facilities and rehabilitation facilities. Those are people that are in the hospital, need care, but not hospital care. So um, 80 patients have been moved out of there. We plan to move another chunk of patients out of there as well. This morning, the hospitals are reporting uh, 91 of those hot, uh, those type of patients that are in those hospitals. The bulk of them are at UVM. Some of them can't be moved because there's other treatment issues that have to be in, in, um, in play here, but a lot of them can be, and that's what we're doing. So one, we're, the strategy is to decamp as many people out of the hospital as possible to make room for you know, any other uh, incidents that, that we have. Number two is to make sure people don't go into the hospital. That's why we've been pushing vaccines. That's why we've been pushing boosters. That's why we've been pushing monoclonal antibodies as a treatment. So that's the second part of the st strategy, make sure that people don't go into the hospitals. And thirdly is to expand capacity, particularly ICU capacity. And we've been talking about this for about a month now, but, but expanding ICU capacity out there. UVM is moving in that direction. Um, we're, you know, each individual hospital is going to have to sort of make the decision at this point what, what procedures they can, they can perform and what procedures they can't perform as the hospital census um, moves up and down depending on what is happening. But I, I can't say enough about how the hospitals have been really good partners with the state in making sure that we meet, meet those three objectives. Make sure you don't go into the hospital with monoclonal antibodies and vaccines. Two is decamp as many people out of the hospital that don't need to be there or can find care in other locations. And number, and number three is build a capacity, and that's what we're doing right now. Can I, just, I just want to add one, one more thing. Again, the monoclonal treatment, which I didn't mention before, and Dr. Levine mentioned this as well. So if you have underlying conditions, you know who you are. If you have underlying conditions and you don't feel well, get tested. And if you test positive, immediately, immediately get a hold of your provider to see if the monoclonal treatment is suitable for you because that will keep you out of the hospital. Um, or a high percentage will keep you out of the hospital. So uh, we want to continue to push that. Sorry. Part of what I was going to ask about, Dr. Levina said multiple times that residents should reach out to their doctors for monoclonal antibodies to see if it's right. Is this something that doctors aren't prescribing? Are they hesitant to do it? We've heard from readers who aren't comfortable bringing a treatment to their doctor. They think that their doctor is someone they trust. Shouldn't the doctor already be aware of this kind of treatment? Why would they need to bring it to the doctor? I will, I will admit, very early in the pandemic, <clears throat> there was a lot of unfamiliarity with the treatment, and not all doctors were on board. But frankly, early in the pandemic, I wasn't on board either, because when you looked at the NIH decisions and other uh, infectious disease guideline-setting bodies, the data wasn't there. Well, the data is more than there now. So it's very robust data, <clears throat> and it it's evidence-based, it works. So I think doctors are more familiar with that now because of that. <clears throat> the problem, if I could put that in quotes, is that we have a free state-run testing system. If you go get a test and I'm your doctor, I may not know your result when you know your result, and I may not even know that you've gone to get a test, and I don't even know if you got a test because you were sick or because you ran into somebody who was sick and just wanted to have some peace of mind or what. So we want that connection to be made early and quick. And the best way for that to happen, because the doctor generally didn't order your test, you ordered your test, is to make sure that you get a result and you immediately have a connection. Uh, because if you know that you're in that group where 
your symptoms are mild, it's in the first couple of days of illness, and you may be at risk of serious illness based on your age or your other medical conditions. We just want you to connect so quickly uh, that seamlessly your doctor can then order the treatment. It is a treatment, so unlike the vaccines that we're doing all around the state, it's a treatment, so that means somebody who has a degree has to order it. And we just want you to be connected quickly. I know when other variants have come out in the past, we, even though it hasn't been detected here, and when Delta was still circulating, we were told to act as if it's already here. Is that the same case with Omicron? Should we just act as if it's already here? Well, you know, the reality is it's in Canada. It's in many countries in Europe. So it'd be hard for me to imagine there not being somebody in the United States who doesn't have it. I won't say Vermont, uh, but somebody in the United States. Uh, I think that reality is what's part of a pandemic. But again, we're not here to create fear and panic. We're just here to be reality-based and say it's showing up in many, many places in the world. So inevitably, it may show up here. And hopefully, if it is, it will be diagnosed quickly, contained, and that will take care of things. But we should just understand that um, even if it is here, we don't know enough about uh, impacts of it to be you know, intimidated and panicked about that. We just have to be realistic and say, it's here. We're going to learn more about it and do the right things. And right now, today, those right things are get your booster and get vaccinated. Well, you know, some early data from South Africa where uh, the physicians themselves who were treating the patients commented that there was more mild to moderate illness and that some people had a presentation with just very significant fatigue. Nobody was presenting with loss of taste or smell. This is very early, though, and I would be very cautious about that information, but that's what they were saying. Um, it would be wonderful if that prophecy fil if, you know, fulfills itself and anybody who got this variant would have a mild case and that would be the end of it. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. And as far as the effectiveness of the vaccine, as you were saying, the NIH director said it may be a couple of weeks before we know if our current vaccines are effective and the CEO of Moderna kind of freaking people out saying, does not think that these vaccines will be effective against the variant. What do you have to say right. to that? I, I'm going to be very balanced in what I have to say. We need to wait and see. Um, you know, the, the reality is um, there are several types of immunity, and we don't know the impact of these mutations on all of the types of immunity that we have that the vaccines actually provide us with, by the way. So I think it'd be premature to say anything more. Thank you. Dr. Levine, I, I have one last question about global health equity. I know we've talked yeah. about this in the past, but you know, lots of countries around the world don't even have access to their, their first shot. Um, so I'm wondering what, what role should the Merck pill um, receive approval or whatever pill what role will technologies like that and also like rapid testing and like lamp testing, um, what will that play on the global, global scale? Yeah, well, everything you raise is important. You know, I, I've been standing here for a long time saying the thing I fear the most about the pandemic is the fact that we have a country, never mind the world, we have a country with very um, different vaccination rates depending on the region of the country you're in. And most of them, other than the Northeast, aren't achieving the highest vaccination rates to really help us with this pandemic. Now we go to the rest of the world, and we clearly have countries who have had 2 3% of their population vaccinated, particularly in Africa. And even countries that are doing well in Africa, like South Africa, it's less than 40%. So uh, there's clearly an equity issue in um, getting the vaccine in a timely way uh, and having it go worldwide if you want to end a pandemic. You can't have a significant part of the population not having had any chance to get immunized against something that we know we can immunize you against. When it comes to the 
Uh, rapid testing, I think that's a little less of an issue in terms of equity. I don't have good data on that, so I'm, I'm going to be a little cautious there. Um, as you'll see in this country, we're just getting now to the point where we're talking about more uh, widespread use of rapid tests that you could have at home and do it yourself. Europe has been there for quite some time, and we're just not there yet. So I would suspect other continents are less there as well. When it comes to the new pill, um, that's, that's a whole different issue. Uh, it's a treatment, uh, so you would think it could be equitably provided around the world. I've already heard that uh, some of the companies that are making some of the pills that are going to be reviewed down the line actually have considered that and are putting into play plans that would involve different costs and distribution systems, et cetera. So, I, you know, equity is a delicate topic. Um, it's, it's never going to be a problem we can solve in one fell swoop with one intervention during a pandemic. But to see progress being made, I think we need to give credit where credit's due. So when that starts to happen, uh, we should certainly credit people with doing the right things. But it's really a, it's a, it's a real challenge, to say the least. One o'clock, so I'm going to move to the phones and start with Lisa from the AP. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm wondering if Dr. Levine could tell us anything more about the outbreak at the Crescent Manor Nursing Home and Rehab in Bennington. Looks like there's 71 cases there. Yes, let me begin by saying, not to reduce the importance of it, but it really does appear this outbreak is the exception, not the rule. When you looked at Commissioner Pichak's slide earlier, you saw a number of long-term care facilities. None of them had a number 70 associated with them. So this is uh, a little bit different than what we've been seeing. This is a little bit more similar to way early in the pandemic when we did have much larger outbreaks at facilities. Uh, we are seeing most of the facilities being very protected by the vaccines and boosters that have been provided uh, to date. Uh, and as Commissioner Pichak has alluded to, some of them are actually having more staff uh, positive cases than resident positive cases. Nonetheless, um, this one is a particularly significant one, and I don't want to reduce the importance of it by any means. It's really our highest current case count for an outbreak with, uh, I believe it's up to 73 cases now and two deaths. I mentioned monoclonal antibodies earlier on, and monoclonal antibodies actually have been deployed at that facility. Uh, for both treatment and for what we call post-exposure prophylaxis, meaning trying to prevent a case occurring in somebody who may have been identified as a contact but isn't a positive case. Um, there's been a lot of staffing support provided to the facility uh, when they needed it most earlier on in the pandemic, because you can imagine when staff become ill, um, that has a tremendous impact uh, on their ability to deliver the care that they do. Um, we continue to meet with our outbreak response team uh, regularly with the facility um, just to make sure that the testing schedule that's appropriate is in place and everyone uh, gets appropriately tended to, if you will, uh, whether it's getting the test at the right time, having the staff that are needed to care for the patients, uh, or following of infection control and prevention kind of guidelines. Um, Unfortunately, um, you mentioned a facility that is in a part of the state that I talked about earlier uh, that has had an increase in cases. So we're seeing the facility reflect the community, if you will, uh, which is so true so often in this, out, in this um, Delta part of the outbreak, but also throughout the pandemic where the community transmission is higher. It shows up in places that um, we don't want it to, but inevitably it can find its way in. Um, 
Were there any other specific things you wanted to hear about? Uh, no, thank you. That's, that should do it. I also have a question for the governor. Um, I'm wondering, Governor, do you think your message about asking people to wear masks indoors is getting out there? Um, it appears in some places that mask wearing has gone, gone down. Um, actually, I see more people wearing masks than I have in quite some time. So I think the message is getting out, but it's not getting out enough. So that's why I'm asking uh, everyone, I'm asking the media to try and encourage the use of masks and not focus on the, um, uh, the division between making it mandated and, uh, and not. Um, it really should be an issue of this would help. This would help in a lot of situations. So if you could, uh, if you could report on the beneficial use of, of masks while indoors uh, in public places, that would be helpful. Thank you. Craig, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, several times in the past year, I've brought up concerns of uh, a lack of uh, resources and manpower with the Vermont State Police in north, Northwestern Vermont. Um, as you probably know, on Sunday evening, state police were called to a double homicide just off Route 2 in Alberg, just a few hundred feet from a major state highway. Um, it took VSP almost a half an hour to get there, and that was just the first trooper. Um, Border Patrol got there first, but that took more than 20 minutes. Um, and I'm wondering, are you still, do you still stand by your previous statements that the St. Albans Barracks has enough troopers? I don't know if you can ever have enough troopers. Um, as you know, as we've been reporting, uh, we have workforce shortages throughout uh, Vermont, throughout uh, the country. And uh, we are, you know, feeling the pressures within the VSP as well. Um, but I would say, uh, I think it was, was it 10 o'clock PM that this occurred? Was that on a Sunday? Yeah. Was that a Sunday night yeah. or a Saturday night? I believe it was a Sunday night. Uh, and I yeah. believe it was uh, right in the middle of a eight hour shift, uh, 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 six to two. Yeah. Ten, right around there. Again, 10 PM on a Sunday night in a, a very broad area, um, I think is challenging. There's no doubt about it, but I might ask, Mr. Sherling to, to comment if he's on the line. I am governor. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a Saturday night, uh, uh, call at 10 PM Saturday. Saturday. Okay. Um, the, it, Greg, you, you've identified a challenge that we've got, uh, statewide, whether you're in a municipality or, uh, for the 200 plus towns that get covered from the state police, uh, as the governor's indicated, we've got staffing in, in every sector, uh, staffing challenges in every sector and law enforcement certainly is not immune from that. I would submit it's probably worse, uh, in public safety generally and in law enforcement in particular than many sectors are facing right now. So. Uh, staffing is a, a challenge, but that said, I, I don't know that we can put that time frame uh, issue on staffing exclusively. It really is more about the the sheer surface area that the state police cover uh, day to day, and uh, 30 minutes is not ideal, but is not unheard of even in the case of a major event uh, that it sometimes takes that long. Uh, just based on uh, even if we were fully staffed, um, it's, it, it's just a it's just a resource issue there there are times when you may wait you know more than an hour uh typically not with a major crime but um you know vermonters unfortunately have to wait a while uh, for law enforcement in many areas uh, of the state yeah but not often you know a few hundred feet from a, a major state highway uh well i have to do some analysis to to sort of give you that more <laughs> granular view but um okay uh, you know, it, it's, uh, this is a challenge, um, and it's not one, uh, it is, it is exacerbated significantly by the, uh, the staffing challenges that we face, but it is a challenge that has been in play for the 30 years that, uh, I've been watching public safety in Vermont. And I, I would have, uh, follow up with that staffing challenge. Oh, sorry, governor. I was just going to say, um, it's not as though, uh, all of the 
troopers are sitting in the barracks either, uh, waiting for a call to come in. They're out patrolling out in the highways, out in, let's say, Richford or Enosburg, and that is quite a distance from uh, Swanton or Alberg. So, um, you know, it, it depends on their positioning. Correct. Uh, this may be for the uh, uh, public safety commissioner. Um, do you know how many people, how many troopers were taken off the roadways uh, that day or that evening to provide security for the World Cup? Uh, World Cup event would not be related, or, or any special event, I should say more broadly, wouldn't be related to general road coverage. That would be something that uh, is an extra duty job, so it's hired, uh, off-duty folks are hired, um, and I don't know what that complement uh, would be. I can find out, but it's unrelated to general okay. staffing. Okay, but if you can't fill all the shifts as it is, um, it might be a, a, an added burden to, to ask people to cover an event and uh, overtime at, at their own barracks. Well, uh, overtime for coverage would take priority over special details. So those would be things that would be okay. covered first. Um, but I can have, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's more granularity than I can provide uh, in terms of that answer. So if you'd like more, I can have someone from the VSB command staff reach out. Sure. Appreciate that. Uh, Governor, one last uh, question here, and this comes from our uh, media partners at Northwest Public Access. Um, they want to know about the possibility of relaxing open meeting laws uh, as it was done in the, in the grand swing of the pandemic. Uh, many boards, you know, a year ago were allowed to, to meet with no public access, uh, just digital access. Um, now boards are required to have uh, a public area for people to meet, uh, even, if a, even if the entirety of a board is going to meet digitally. Um, I, I guess they're asking, this is creating a, a logistical problem for many boards and is there anything at your level that, that you can do to relax some of those uh, rules, still have uh, public meetings, still have, you know, a, a, a record of what's going on, um, but relax some of those uh, regulations until the more recent COVID numbers subside? Um, without a... Without a state of emergency, I'm not sure that we could do anything about that uh, as the executive branch at this point. Uh, but the legislature is coming back into session soon. I'd be happy uh, to discuss this with the Secretary of State as well and, uh, and then work together uh, to try and find a solution that will work uh, for all Vermont. All right, we're going to need to move to the next okay. question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Lisa, the Valley That's it for me. Good afternoon. We're hearing um, a lot of concern from people in our community who cannot leave their jobs to get a PCR test or lamp test or even a take-home PCR test. They're wondering how they can get tested if they or their kids become symptomatic or receive notice that they've been exposed. Um, and they're also wondering if there are a way to access rapid at-home tests if they can't afford to buy them or order them online. Is there a plan? I think I asked this last week and was told about the lamp test, but is there a plan to provide rapid at home antigen tests to people through community outlets? We are working on an initiative uh, that uh, has been reported in New Hampshire uh, that caught our attention. So we reached out to New Hampshire to see uh, what they did to provide these, uh, the, the vast number of, of tests available through Amazon. Um, so we're, um, we're exploring that. There are um, some um, some obstacles in the way, but um, but that's where we're heading, and hopefully uh, we'll have some news on that uh, in the days ahead, uh, because we know, as uh, Dr. Levine has said, uh, all of us have said, this is the way of the future. Uh, we need to have tests available uh, at home, antigen tests, uh, our rapid tests are, are um, instrumental in determining whether you're positive or not and uh, preventing spread. So again, Secretary Smith. Thank you, Lisa, for the question. We've been working with the White House um, to, to talk about uh, bringing in additional uh, uh, 
rapid tests, uh, antigen tests in particular with the White House. The governor is also just mentioned, we're also talking with a model that New Hampshire is doing with NIH and Amazon and looking at bringing in uh, rapid tests. The supply chain has been the issue um, as, we, as we have been looking out there, but the White House has been working with us to try to find out how to bring in the appropriate number of uh, test kits, um, antigen test kits into here. I mean, we've, we've asked for 250, 250,000 to help with both long-term care, with school testing, and with um, general public testing. But that would only last us, uh, you know, a matter of a, a month, maybe. Uh, we need we need a really good supply chain in order to keep that keep that going. And what's encouraging is what the governor had mentioned, um, and also the White House has been very encouraging in trying to help us out find those antigen tests. So I, I'm, I know I said stay tuned last week. We're still working as quickly as we can on getting these antigen tests into Vermont. And speaking of PCR testing, I know that there's some people and businesses in our community that are working with um, your office and the Vermont Agency of Health about creating PCR and I believe LAMP testing opportunities for people in the Mad River Valley. And I'm wondering if you have an update on those efforts as well as a potential timeline. You're way ahead of me on that one. Um, I. I know that I had asked if we could look into uh, providing uh, additional testing in the Mad River Valley. I didn't realize they were that far ahead, so thank you very much for uh, telling me that they, they have started the initiation. I had said last week after Thanksgiving we would start looking at that, and I'm glad to hear from you that uh, we have started uh, to look at that and- uh, Well, the, the conversations have, sorry to interrupt, the conversations have started yep. and there are local EMS who are willing to administer the same type of a program that was held here last weekend where testing was available Saturdays and Sundays throughout from December until May. Yeah, we're, And we're, there's efforts available, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. no, we're, we're definitely looking at that and as you can, surmise where um, uh, I was pretty interested in, in doing that when you asked the question. Thank you for that. And I will keep pestering you about the um, distribution of rapid at-home antigen tests for those who can't afford to buy them. If you can find 250,000 uh, tests on a biweekly basis, I would uh, uh, just tell me where to go and I'll, I'll, I'll hunt them down. I will do that. Where's New Hampshire getting theirs? Uh, or Amazon getting theirs? And NIH in some regards. And that was what the governor is saying, trying to part and do the same sort of partnership there. Great. Thank you for your time. I don't want to give you the impression that uh, Amazon is the provider. It is through different manufacturers, and they're the shipper. So they would distribute uh, the test. I think that's what they're doing in New Hampshire. But we're trying to run down all those details and see if it would be useful for us uh, to get in the same program. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that information. Erin, D.C. Digger. Hi. Um, today, the former health commissioner for Vermont, Dr. Harry Chen, came out with a commentary saying that Vermont needs a mass mandate. Um, does it concern you that you're out of step with a kind of former state leader? I have a lot of respect for um, Dr. Chen and uh, did a lot of good work in Vermont and served in the House when I was in the Senate. Um, but again, from my standpoint, having a mass mandate doesn't make it so. It doesn't make uh, people wear a mask. The people who want to wear masks are wearing them now. Providing um, a more controversy with a mass mandate hardens both sides. I'm asking people to wear masks when indoors in public spaces. It is effective when you're wearing them. But I'm making, forcing people with a mass mandate doesn't necessarily make it so. There's no magic wand uh, to provide for that. Uh, you, can, you can look at other states to see what they're doing or not doing, and it's proving 
uh, that we're beyond this, that it's not effective to have a mandate. They just can't get people, force people, to wear them that are unwilling. So we just have a difference of opinion on that. What we do share uh, in a common goal, I think, Dr. Chen would probably agree, is that we want people to wear masks when they're indoors. So let's focus on the area where we agree uh, and not keep focusing on the controversial mask mandate. You could be Dr. very, Levine, Aaron, do you have any, Aaron, 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 you could be very helpful in this regard. Dr. Levine. I mean, I've, I've put um, your recommendation, put an indoor mask on in pretty much every press conference story I have written. Uh, but sorry, I was just wondering if Dr. Levine had any thoughts about um, the fact that he's now kind of in conflict with his predecessor. Oh, God, God forbid we're in conflict. <clears throat> no way. Number one, I do believe in masks. Number two, I do believe the literature on mask mandates, which predates Delta, showed that mask mandates were effective. However, I also understand and I've talked to current health commissioners in all of the states that have had a mask mandate during Delta, which is less than two hands, it's half a dozen, plus the District of Columbia. And their first comment is, it's very different now. Compliance is very challenging. And they've been uh, not only compliance issues, but I won't use the word violence, but certainly a lot of dissension where people are in people's faces about the masks because they're mandated. So it's a real challenging time. I think Delta is a, a different virus in a sense. It's very transmissible. I'm not so sure if we could do an assessment of mass mandates in the Delta era. It would show all the same data that was predating the Delta era. And clearly, the main factor is the population is in a different place. So we're trying to uh, have the population work with us on doing the right thing, which is to wear a mask indoors. But at the same time, the population, not just Vermont's, but elsewhere as well, uh, is trying to move on from the pandemic in many ways and regard something like masks as a reminder of an era that they thought they had left and could move on from. Um, so. I think the way we do it is really the thing that's being questioned, not the fact that we all believe people should be wearing masks. And I would just want to add one thing, because I do think most Vermonters and even most people in general underestimate when the mask is most effective. And yes, we do want you to wear it in public places. We do believe that when you walk into the supermarket, it's a good thing to wear it. But I would submit, if you did a risk assessment, you would find that if you had four families over to your house, that was a much more dangerous environment for you to be in than a casual person walking through the supermarket, checking out in less than five minutes, and leaving the store. So I would like people to think about where they may not be wearing masks right now, but where the exposure risk might actually be higher than they might have anticipated. Even with people they trust and are good friends with and all of that, uh, because it's a time of high virus community transmission. So I would just want people to think even more expansively about where they should wear the mask uh, in a voluntary way, but in a way that is working for them in their lives and uh, that they're evaluating their risk and understanding that this is a time to put a mask on. Okay, that's all. Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to take a breath from COVID for a moment, Governor, uh, it's been discussed in your conferences before. Uh, with everyone in the in Vermont worried about public safety, and with the lack of uh, enough troopers because we don't have enough employees for them. Have you done or are you able to access any research that would show the opportunity to make a larger force by uh, removing the tax on uh, military who have retired 
on their retirement benefits, so maybe more of them would move to Vermont and maybe take up a job in law enforcement? Yeah. Uh, we haven't done the analysis, uh, but, uh, but, but this is something that I've been promoting for the last five years, and I think it is a barrier. We're one of uh, less than 10 states that still taxes uh, military pensions. So, again, those who are retiring from the military uh, would be beneficial to the state in so many ways from a workforce uh, standpoint. They're in their, some of them are in their uh, 40s um, and, uh, and still uh, able and ready, willing, and able to work. And we certainly need to increase in all areas, all sectors uh, of our economy. We need more workers, and uh, certainly uh, it, with the military background, in some cases, uh, that could be in law enforcement. So, um, yeah, we think it's uh, beneficial and it could be helpful. One, it's not the total answer. Um, we need more people to move here, uh, but um, but that would be helpful to us in uh, in many regards. Do you think if you had hard evidence uh, through some study? Uh, with the armed forces in retirement, that that might sway the legislature to take this issue up? Um, I think it's hard to prove because there's so few states that uh, that have uh, continue to tax the military or the military pensions. So all the other states, uh, forty some odd states, um, have removed the tax. So they're benefiting at this point in time, and I think it's. It's, again, anecdotally speaking to uh, many who retire from the military, and, and I'm sure you've uh, spoken to a few yourself, uh, they, they pay attention to that. They, they watch that. And if there's a, a tax where it's you know, a disadvantage to move to a state and retire in a state uh, that takes more money away from you out of your pocket, uh, you tend not to want to settle there. There are 40 some odd other states uh, that have uh, uh, are mu much more attractive. Well, yes, anecdotally, uh, I've spoken to a large number of native Vermonters who elected not to return home to their home state after serving the, just for that specific reason. But I appreciate that. One last question. I know it's early on, but have you received many uh, recommendations for people doing acts of kindness during the holiday season? Uh, not at this point, but... Uh, uh, while you give us the opportunity, we'd love to hear uh, from people. We need a little bit of hope out there. Uh, we need there are a lot of good things happening in our state and across the country, uh, but they uh, they don't get reported on and they don't get highlighted. So uh, we are asking everyone if they uh, if they have someone who uh, who has done something good. It could be very small. Please let us know. Uh, we want to recognize that. We want to promote that. Uh, we and we hope, uh, we hope uh, that uh, this will promote and uh, enhance uh, again the acts of kindness that are happening every day uh, that people don't have an opportunity to read about because of all the other controversy uh, around the world and and COVID in particular. So, uh, thank you for that for bringing it up and just asking people to submit. If they know someone uh, who's done a good deed, let us know. Okay, no more questions for me. Thanks very much. Thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris, Newport Daily Express. All right, we'll go to Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I was wondering what your take is on the economic effects of Omicron already. There's uh, the stock market been hit for concerns about it, and there's also concerns about increasing inflation as the supply chain could get bogged down. I'm just wondering what your take is on it and what the effect in Vermont might be. Well... Time will t tell, and uh, from our standpoint, uh, again, I don't want to speculate. I want to get the real information, the facts, and the truth about this uh, new variant and um, what it affects might be. Uh, but I think uh, there were some news organizations early on last week uh, that uh, wanted to create more 
controversy and and um, and and I think that the, the markets are hypersensitive right now and reacted uh, because they heard bad news and they heard uh, that there may not be you know the vaccines might not be effective against it when nobody really knew that and it's just unfortunate uh, when the news gets out just to create controversy uh, and does uh, does harm and I think they did some harm to the economy in doing so but. That's why we want to continue to just let's get the facts uh, before we jump to any conclusions. And I think that that's something that we've tried to do over the last year and a half, and we need to continue to do. And then we'll react accordingly uh, based on the information that we receive. All right, great, thank you. Chris, Brattleboro Reformer. Good afternoon. I have a question for Secretary French. Uh, we've heard from a local parent who is wondering why the age cutoff for test to stay is five and older, and uh, their family feels because the preschoolers can't be vaccinated yet, testing is their only tool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we are working on extending uh, test to stay down to the four year old population and also for childcare. Um, we started with the, the 5 through 12 population because we have the logistical apparatus basically to implement test to stay through the school system. But it is something we're interested in expanding as, you know, throughout the press conference today, I think people have acknowledged that, uh, you know, ex expanding testing is going to be the wave of the future. And it's, we need to get that out to the point of uh, use as best we can. But we're definitely thinking of expanding to pre-K. All right. Do you have any timeline on that? Uh, it's something we're working on actively this week. Uh, as I mentioned in my comments, there's two variables, I think. One is the supply, um, but we're feeling comfortable about that. The second piece is just the logistics of, uh, you know, supporting that testing approach in with that younger population. So we're working on it actively, so hopefully have some news on that soon. All right. Thanks a lot. Yep. Hey, sorry for the delay. Um, Dr. Levine, uh, you've said previously that um, a 5% uh, percent positivity rate is uh, one of the thresholds that Vermont should be concerned about um, if and when it passes it. I'm wondering how concerned you are about the 4.7 number on the dashboard today and what, if anything, Vermont does in terms of its uh, approach to COVID if we exceed that 5% threshold? <clears throat> yeah, what I've mentioned before is that 5% was a CDC sort of set level for different levels of transmission and implications of that. Um, you know, Vermont has never been to that level except one very brief instant in the very early part of the pandemic when uh, we had no resources to do with anything with anything at that time. Um, so I, I think the recent increase, um, we have to watch with a little bit of caution because uh, I'm hoping that that will come down because there'll be more people taking advantage of testing than did during the holiday period. And the proportion of people who are symptomatic may have been higher during that time accessing testing and that's what that increased rate is showing, as opposed to giving us a real snapshot as to what the entire population is experiencing with regard to COVID. So we'll have to watch and see as we have more of that non-symptomatic testing, whether it be uh, people who had gathered, whether it be people who were close contacts um, or other mechanisms in surveillance testing uh, to see if that number comes down. Uh, obviously, you know, we're at a time in the region where there's a continuing surge. And as you saw on the slides, uh, it's not sparing uh, anyone in New England at this point in time. So the region is experiencing that same increase. So we're a little bit uh, victims of that phenomena in itself as well. Again, you know, as we discussed with, with masks and, and all of that, there are only so many tools in the toolbox 
So when you ask for some implications about, well, what we do this next thing, there aren't that many next things, really, when it comes to uh, the pandemic management. Um, and it's really, um, the next things would be uh, on the level of very, very stringent kinds of uh, restrictions on people's lives, which uh, a 5% positivity rate would not be the prime force that would generate that. I think Commissioner Pichak wants to add something, so hold on. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and thanks, Peter. I just wanted to put an um, example for Dr. Levine's point that he made. On Thanksgiving Day itself this year, um, you know, about 1,000 tests were conducted, and we had about 100 positive results, so a 10 percent positivity rate. And it just shows you that you're not going to go get tested on Thanksgiving uh, unless you think you've been exposed or have symptoms. Um, similarly, over the weekend, you know, people were traveling, people had friends and family, uh, you know, at their home potentially. Um, and we saw just, you know, much less testing happening through the holiday weekend as well. So I think just much more likely you're going to get um, a test again if you had symptoms uh, or have an exposure relative to a normal period of time. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, uh, I guess likely for Secretary Smith or perhaps Dr. Levine, um, it's been a month now since uh, 5 to 11 vaccines were approved, uh, and we're starting to see a growing disparity in vaccination rates uh, between counties um, in that age bracket, with 18% in Essex County, 21% in Orleans, going up to 54% of 5 to 11-year-olds in Chittenden. Um, is this a reflection of access and perhaps school clinic scheduling, or do you think patterns of uptake are beginning to reveal themselves? I think so this is Secretary French. Um, I still think it's a bit early um, to see what those patterns are. I think I foreshadowed. I expect we will see uh, patterns uh, along those lines after the first of the year. And um, I think it will be increasingly a focus of our policies and supports for school districts in particular, um, because I think those districts that are able to achieve a higher student vaccination rate are going to have more stability in their operations than those that don't. Um, but my impression right now is I think it's a bit early to uh, understand those patterns. So is it just a question then of, of scheduling more clinics and, and making uh, vaccine doses more available? And in that instance, then, um, does it come down to rurality? No, I guess from my perspective, you know, we do handle the logistics on this, that there are still a lot of clinics that haven't been held yet. So I think it's just too early. So if for whatever reason, there might be schools that haven't even had their first clinic yet or regions that haven't had those scheduled, or they're on the calendar per se, but they just haven't happened yet. So I think we just need to be patient and let the logistics sort of unfold. Okay, thank you very much. I think I would just make one additional point, and that is that I would think there'd be a very high ability to predict a five-year-old getting vaccinated based on the vaccination status of the parent. So, as you know, we do have disparities in our counties overall with regard to vaccination rates of the adult population. So I wouldn't be surprised if the children of adults who chose to get vaccinated were vaccinated and the children of adults who chose not to get vaccinated might not be vaccinated. I don't know that for a fact because we haven't surveyed that specifically, but I think there'd be a fair amount of predictability about that. And in that sense, some of the county data may just mirror the general county data for all people of all ages in that county. Uh, hi, so I was wondering um, if most of our census right now in hospitals is not COVID-19 patients, does it really sort of make sense to, to um, push on monoclonal antibodies? Like is that enough for us to weather what's coming uh, with the flu season and everything else for capacity? Yeah, the, the monoclonal treatment um, is an effective tool uh, that we have. But as Dr. Levine has said, there is a bit of a disconnect between, let's say, someone who doesn't even get tested, who just 
gets sick, doesn't get tested, doesn't notify their provider, and just ends up in the emergency room. When that happens, it's too late. Um, that's why we're trying to uh, communicate that if you're, if you test, if you if you don't, if you have underlying conditions, especially if you have underlying conditions, uh, and you don't feel well, get tested immediately. Get tested, and as soon as you find out, get a hold of your provider so that they can uh, set up this monoclonal treatment, which can keep you out of the hospital. So that's the. Um, you know, there's a number of steps uh, in the way. If we could get to them immediately, uh, that would be beneficial. And, you know, maybe we'll have to talk about how, how we can do that from a testing standpoint, but I'm, I'm just not sure how we can. Um, Follow-up question, maybe uh, similar but not uh, like related. Um, I wanted to know at what point, uh, I know that other states have uh, made use of uh, FEMA personnel for their hospital capacity to alleviate shortages. Are we at that point yet? And if not, when would that point be? Yeah. I mean, we have reached out uh, to check with FEMA to see what's, uh, what's possible. And uh, to say that FEMA is stretched thin, because this is a nationwide problem. There's just a workforce shortage. Um, Secretary Smith can answer the rest of that. Yeah, we, we have reached out um, in to FEMA for some prioritized uh, uh, personnel. The, the, the first one would be to help in um, administering um, monoclonal antibodies and having teams up that would be um, would be available for that. The second one would be if we design something that isn't in, really in Vermont yet, uh, especially at critical care facilities, is if we design something called a step-down unit that's in between sort of med surge beds and and ICU beds, and had the ability to um, have that step-down capability, what would that take in terms of personnel uh, looking at various options? So we have been in contact with them on a multitude of things, but those are the two top priorities that we've been sort of discussing with them. And as the governor said, they're pretty stretched. Um, I think what we're going to have to do is figure this out ourselves and or um, with very, very modest, if, you know, on the monoclonal in particular, uh, probably very modest intervention or not even intervention, help uh, from FEMA. I, I think we're, like most other states out here, we, we need to, uh, we need to self-administer how we're looking at uh, uh, various options here. Thank you. belief what we've heard from FEMA as well is that uh, other states are much worse off than we are. So they, uh, they have to prioritize. Joseph Gresser, The Barton Chronicle. Joe Gresser, The Barton Chronicle. All right, we'll go to Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Um, I really appreciate all that good information on the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, I did have a, uh, a very well-known doctor ask me yesterday, is the state keeping track of the success rate of the monoclonal antibody treatments? How, how is it working? Is, is it working well, and are there any real numbers or studies on this? Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll ask uh, Dr. Levine about that, but uh, but we believe it is working. Uh, we continue to see improvement in that area, so it's an effective treatment. So the, the way you uh, judge success is the important criteria here, and I think the most important indicator would be um, are you preventing hospitalizations in the people who you gave antibody to? 
So it's a little difficult to prove the thesis because if they don't end up in the hospital, were they not going to end up there anyways? Or did they not end up in the hospital because you gave them the monoclonal antibodies? Anecdotally, because um, I have weekly calls with uh, hospitals around the state um, to find out if they're seeing people admitted who were on monoclonal antibodies. And there are very, very few uh, in that category. That's about all I have to go on right now in terms of data. I don't have any more firm data to give you. But that, that's at least a, a very positive sign, if you will. Do you expect to be uh, collecting that kind of information? Yes. Just don't have it for you right now. Oh, very good. OK. OK, thank you. Uh, Governor, uh, you asked uh, Calvin Cutler last week to, to ask the, uh, the Senate leaders, uh, what, other, what other measures would, would they have in mind? What other possible measures would they have to control COVID-19? And uh, since then, uh, boy, in Australia and Europe, we're seeing uh, the things like the forced removal to quarantine camps of positive COVID-19 cases very aggressive measures. Is that anything that, uh, I almost feel funny asking this, but is that anything that you can imagine happening in Vermont? I mean, is that is that one of the things that could possibly be on the table? Uh, no, I can't, I can't imagine that being on the table. Well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know what others uh, think, but from my perspective, uh, I don't, that, that wouldn't be on the table from my perspective. Thank you. Derek, seven days. Yeah, hello there. Um, you mentioned that the hospital surge uh, we'll, we're seeing is in Rutland and Bennington counties. I, I didn't, I don't think I heard mention of any plans in the works to increase ICU capacity in those counties. Um, can you tell me more about whether those hospitals currently have uh, ICU beds and uh, what plan, if any, is in place to manage that situation in southwestern Vermont? Yeah, we've been working with them for the last several several weeks, um, Secretary Smith. Derek, it's actually been more than a month we've been working with them on, on this sort of thing. We've went out and asked them what they need most in terms of you know in freeing up capacity within their um their institutions and and they said moving subacute patients out of their their um, the hospitals into other care facilities and we've been doing that as i've mentioned we did 80 already uh, we're planning you know to do 47 here um, more a lot of them in the first 80 tranche, um, there was a Rutland facility that we used um, uh, in terms of making sure that there was a long-term care rehab facility in Rutland. This second wave, we will have a Rutland rehab facility as well available, rehab and uh, long-term care rehab facility available down in that region. We are working with Bennington. Um, there is a there is a long-term care rehab facility right near the hospital there. We're working with them to open up some beds. In terms of ICU capacity, we have worked with, um, with Southwestern to open up two additional, and as I reported, one is already open, um, uh, two additional ICU beds in that area. And we continue to work with Rutland uh, because they, they said the emphasis was on moving patients out of the hospital into the subacute locations that we have and, and freeing up uh, patients so that they could move them out of the ICUs. So um, we've been working closely with both Rutland and Southwest. But Could you explain subacute? Yes, I, I, let me explain subacute because uh, my boss just told me to do it. So let me, uh, uh, let me explain what subacute means. Subacute are patients that are in, in the hospital but really don't need to be at a hospital level of care, but they need care. 
Um, so when uh, people are in a hospital, what was happening was people were being um, stuck in a hospital. There was just no place to move them. We as a state helped uh, financially uh, bring, bring in staffing. There was no staffing at these long-term care rehab facilities to accommodate this. We helped those long-term care and staffing facilities uh, and rehabilitation facilities to uh, bring in staffing to, uh, to accommodate moving uh, these patients out and freeing up beds in the hospital. We continue to do that. Um, we will continue to do that in Bennington. Uh, we will continue to do that in Rutland. And we will continue to do it uh, up in the uh, Chittenden County area where there's beds available. Thanks. And, and can you clarify, are there any open ICU beds in, in hospitals in those counties right now? There are, um, there, there are open ICU beds in, at the University of Vermont, at Rutland, if I'm reading this right. Um, I don't see Southwestern, I don't see an open ICU bed. Uh, today, but these things fluctuate every day. I mean, it can it can go up and down depending on the day. Okay, and uh, one other question. Um, I'm hearing some folks are uh, seeing long wait times to uh, book booster appointments through the health department's website. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, I'd like to understand if that's anecdotal or if, the, if you're seeing um, uh, uh, wait times on, on that front. Derek, I haven't heard of any um, incidences, but let it, let me check into it just to make sure. Yeah, and you know we we are uh, we are experiencing some wait times with walk-ins, uh, but let me just uh, let me just check for you on that, okay? Yeah, thanks. I, I I heard one person saying they couldn't book an appointment until after Christmas, which sounded uh, quite a ways away. Uh, compared to where we have them. Yeah, I, I, that would be hard for me to believe, but let me look. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll see you again next week.